So what started off as a belt test has become something that's a little bit more substantial than that. When I actually loosened up the belt a little bit to do some uh, testing and see if that would cut down on the belt noise when I put the, uh, the Fenner, uh, Fenner linked belt on there, I suddenly had a chattering coming from what sounded like the bearing on the top here. So I figured I'd uh, tear into it and see what's going on. So I'm documenting it while I'm going along the way. I uh, figured I might as well make a video. So a couple things that need to be done. First of all, this has to be disconnected so that you can get the uh, get the pulley off. Uh, in fact, that may be... Uh, I don't remember exactly why, but I took it out. It's back in now so that I can lock the spindle and get to the uh, uh, the pinholes here on the, uh, the spindle nut. Uh, but additionally, the pulley will not come off unless you have this casting out of the way. So I actually picked it up with one hand, lifted the pulley off, and then set it back down. Uh, not the easiest thing I've done in my life, but wasn't too bad. The, uh, the pulley itself was held in place by this nut, which was no more than finger tight on there. Um, not certain exactly what sort of problem that is. It does have a a key that drives it, so it's not it's not as though the uh, pulley was going to slip. The uh, uh, the nut came loose. All you have to do is back off the uh, Phillips screw, and then it it came unscrewed. I don't have the correct tool. Uh, I believe it's called an adjustable. In the case of what Tormach is referring to, it it's adjustable because this the distance between these two pins are different than the two pins on the opposite side here. So they're using an adjustable. It's a uh, face uh, pin spanner is what's being used. I think that's the correct terminology. Uh, a couple of the other parts laying around here. That's it so far. Uh, I think at this point I'm going to have to drop the spindle out the bottom. Uh, I don't think a spanner would fit down in here. It's too far below. Typically a spanner wrench is uh, two arms and then the pins are sticking directly out of that. So there's no way that it would engage over the top of this. Uh, over the top of this uh, casting here. So I think the spindle has to come out the bottom and that's what I'm going to do next. Alright, the cartridge is coming out pretty easily. Uh, one of the things you'll notice if you're a Tormach Duality lathe owner is that the uh, quick change tool post mount, which I've got right here, which mounts in this orientation on the spindle nose has to be removed. So after you spend a bunch of time aligning that, you will have to realign it later. Uh, but it comes out easily. Uh, so in other words, it's not press fit into the, uh, the housing or anything, uh, into the casting. Not terribly surprising, I suppose. The, uh, the bolts were all slightly more than uh, finger tight. Uh, they came loose very easily. Uh, it seems to be a common theme on my mill. I found a lot of bolts that were hardly more than just snug. The last two bolts that were holding the spindle cartridge in place are now out. See I've dropped the uh, nose of the mill right down onto the table, uh, well on top of the cardboard that's on the table. Uh, it allowed me, had the bolts back most of the way out, uh, putting the mill nose down on the table, push the spindle back in just a little bit. You see I don't have it, I don't have it forced in. Uh, and then I was able to loosen the bolts by hand now I should be able to just raise the mill and uh, raise the z-axis and the uh, spindle cartridge will drop right out. Uh, should be mentioned that one of the things I discovered here is that this is part of the casting and then the, uh, the spindle cartridge starts right there. So that was just about as easy as it gets. Just raise up the mill head and uh, the cartridge stayed, stayed put. So now it's time to disassemble it. All right, the nut is free. I'm getting ready to drive the shaft out of the inside of the bearings here. Uh, I was taking a look at this component right here. This is essentially the shield that keeps the debris out of the bearing. So it fits down over the top and uh, protects the assembly from gunk. Uh, only seals are on the outside, if you can call it a seal. It rotates with the, uh, with the shaft here. So I've actually reinstalled the spindle cartridge back in the head so that I can have something firm to hold it while I tap the uh, um, 
shaft out of the inside of the bearings. So it's going pretty well so far. Just keep raising it up a little bit, tap it out a little more, raise it up. Being extremely conservative with this, don't want to damage anything of course. The shaft is now free of the uh, spindle cartridge. Two of the bearings came out as expected with the shaft, no surprise there. I uh, haven't examined them to see what the configuration is. It does appear as though there's some sort of uh, grease or something located in between. Everything appears to be intact, so any concerns about coolant getting in there so far uh, haven't proven to be uh, founded. So that's it. On to the next step. I'm in the process of removing the bearings from the uh, shaft here. One of the things I noticed was this little detail here. I have no idea if this is going to show up in the video or not, but there's a little V scribed across the outer rings of each of the bearings here. Now the bearings can rotate independent of one another. What you're seeing here is the uh, this is the upper outer ring of the uh, lower pair of bearings in the spindle. So this is toward the bottom where the uh, collet goes in. All of the uh, the balls were liberated. The race, uh, the the, the uh, balls are not retained in the race at all. Uh, they just uh, drop in. When this was pressed out of the spindle, we actually had to press it from the uh, from the inside. When it was pressed out, the orientation of the ring was like this physically inside the uh, inside the spindle cartridge, so that it was easy to push the um, to push the uh, the inner ring and the erase and the ball bearings through along with the bottom. So the bottom came out just fine because it's uh, pressing down this way pushes against the lower angular contact surface so that it, it pushed the uh, so that it pushed the um, the outer ring out just fine when it when it came out. So this is exactly how it came out. I haven't touched it. The only thing I've done was uh, sorted out the balls here. I haven't even looked at it. Nothing's been clean. Uh, it doesn't look like there's any evidence of spalling here. Uh, certainly no evidence of corrosion. Uh, so that's what we got for the uh, for the lower. And I'll uh, be taking a better look at the other set of bearings here. Getting ready to grease the sets of bearings for the Tormach spindle. These are the lower spindle bearings and the upper spindle bearings. The uh, markings Hopefully they show up in the uh, video here. Let's see if I can see them. That sort of V-shaped marking that's right there. And there's a matching one over on the uh, lower spindle bearing set here. Uh, when installed, the arrows should point toward each other. And I'm not certain that they need to be lined up necessarily, but they certainly need to be in this configuration with a small V uh, on the inside and the big V or the big portion of the V on the outside. So I'm getting ready to put the grease in the bearings. What I got was a water resistant uh, high pressure lithium grease. It's also got a uh, molly as a uh, carrier in there as well. Uh, the method I'm using is uh, putting the, uh, the grease in a uh, Ziploc bag to actually pipe it into the bearings. So there's a limit to how much grease you should have in there. And the uh, the goal is to get the right balance. If there's too much grease in the uh, in the bearing, it will actually churn, uh, generating excess heat. So you got to have the right amount of grease. Uh, one would hope that the bearing would be able to pump out any extra grease, but I imagine if you packed it full, it wouldn't be so happy with that uh, that situation. So I'm getting ready to apply the grease and uh, go from there. In the meanwhile, the spindle cartridge is in the oven, warming up to 210 degrees. This works substantially easier than I thought it would. I just cut about an eighth of an inch off the corner of the bag and uh, piped it in. I was able to actually get the tip of the bag down in between the uh, outer ring and the cage without a problem and then just squeeze the bag while I moved it around. Uh, these are a little bit... Uh, uh, more overflowing on the grease uh, with the grease than these are mostly because I went back and retouched these in a couple of areas where I didn't get it quite the way I wanted the first time through uh, but you see there's not even any grease on the outside so far this method has worked out pretty well I'm uh, 
comfortable with the amount of grease that is in the uh, gap between the cage and the outer ring and it's, the grease is even on both sides. When I uh, turn the inner ring uh, while holding the outer ring the cage moves at about half the speed so that, uh, that means everything's functioning properly. Alright, I'm halfway through the process right now. I got the uh, housing to 210 degrees, uh, measured to 205 with my infrared non-contact pyrometer, but the emissivity setting, of course, is random. Steel is ridiculous. Anything polished with a shiny surface, you can't get the emissivity on. So I'm about to flip it over and put the uh, top bearings in. So maybe I'll, maybe I'll set this off to the side and record that process. I have no idea how this is lined up. I've got uh, Nomex gloves on. The lower races have been in there for a minute, so they've warmed up. Checking the bearings to be sure that i got the right one for this application. And if you get them just right, they drop right in without a problem. So the bearings themselves are at room temperature. Which in this case is about, looks like it's about 70, 65, somewhere in that range. Well, that's it. I can't believe how easy that was. So, this, this sucker is pretty warm. I, uh, I felt the heat coming through quickly. Now I'm going to have uh, Nomex on and the rubber gloves underneath for a little bit of, I don't want to call it protection, but a little bit of extra time. But that's it. They're in. Now they're not seated. I wouldn't consider them seated at this point. I just consider them in place. I'll still do the seating process once I get the um, once I get the uh, shaft in place. But I don't want to mess with that right now. I'm just going to let the uh, uh, let the, uh, what do they call it, the outer ring warm up a little bit. I keep thinking maybe I'll try to take some heat out, but there's a lot of heat in this deal. I mean, it weighs 8 pounds, 10 pounds, something like that. Maybe a little bit more. And it's been in the oven at 210 degrees for an hour, so maybe even an hour and a half. So there you have it. I actually set it on, set the oven on the convection setting and had the fan in the convection stove blowing through the shaft or through the through the bore so that it would uh, warm up as evenly as possible and as quickly as possible. It still took about an hour, hour and a half to warm up. So there you have it. And uh, that was easier than I thought. So I have the spindle cartridge housing and the bearings uh, sitting down on the shaft right now. Maybe a little bit difficult to see. Uh, but there is, of course, a tight fit between the shaft and the inner ring of the bearing. So I'm trying to figure out how I am going to get them on there without a press. That's the whole idea of this. The um, uh, idea that, or the solution that I've come up with is essentially to use a, a piece of PVC that slips uh, with some reasonable amount of tightness over the the shaft and presses on the inner ring to push it down. So really what I'm doing at this point is uh, pushing the whole assembly together by uh, drawing the shaft up through. So since the inner rings are not going to be uh, moving since they're, the, the bearings are seated all the way, uh, what that essentially do will draw the shaft in. So that'll seat the bearings uh, onto the shaft or sh seat the shaft on the bearings, however you want to look at that. So the solution I came up with was uh, one and a quarter schedule 40 PVC, uh, cut it to length and I'm going to use, since I can't get to the threads yet, let me show you here, since I can't get to the threads yet for the preload screw or the preload uh, nut, I'm going to use these threads right here on the uh, the pulley, this is the, this is the nut that holds the pulley in place, I'll use that to squeeze everything together. That's the idea at least. Alright, so continuing with the bearing installation, I originally thought I needed this cap, but I realized that the nut fits snugly down on the top surface of the 
pipe without the cap in place, so there's really essentially no meaning. Uh, however, the travel on the thread is only going to be about three quarters of an inch, uh, probably not even that much, probably more like uh, five eighths or something along those lines. So I can't I can't move so much at a time. So I needed several pieces of different lengths of the PVC in order to uh, compress it down. So I haven't figured that out exactly yet, but this is a this piece that I've got in there right now is a good starting piece. Uh, I do need to get my uh, the wrench that is the other half. Uh, let me see here. This would be it. Looks an awful lot like the uh, holding uh, tool, but that's essentially it. So I just advanced it some some proportion. I'll just keep turning it now. Not the cleanest <laughs> method in the world, I suppose, but looks like it's going to work just fine. The uh, nut that's on here now should be torqued to the value that I want it to be torqued to. We'll see if that actually works out once I start doing cuts. See if there's any float of the shaft inside the uh, spindle cartridge, uh, spindle cartridge housing and the bearings. Uh, the way I did it actually was uh, I didn't use a press uh, to push the shaft in. Instead, I used the uh, PVC spacers that you see here. Basically, I uh, stacked it up on top of the uh, uh, dis the discourager ring or the slinger ring, whatever you want to call it, here underneath the uh, stack nut. Uh, the this nut wasn't there, of course. Slid the the spacer over the top, and then I used the uh, nut. I'll grab it real quick. I used the nut that was uh, that is used to hold the pulley in place uh, to tighten everything together. The uh, I think they call this adjustable face pin wrench, four millimeter pins on the end. Uh, that was the uh, uh, that's the device that you use to tighten it down. Uh, I use the uh, the fork here that keeps the spindle from turning when you're uh, doing a tool change to hold the uh, hold the shaft in place while I turn the nut. Of course I greased underneath the uh, grease underneath all the surfaces. Now this system worked fine until I got to the point where the spacer itself was starting to engage with the uh, not the spacer but the uh, the slinger or discourager was starting to interface with the part of the shaft that was passing through the bearing and that's the, the part where this is a, a close fit to. As soon as that started happening the uh, as I was tightening the nut, let me back up a little bit here, as I was tightening the nut the PVC was spinning with the nut and the slinger ring because the two were uh, loose and essentially able to do it or maybe, the, I'm not certain that the PVC wasn't sliding across the top face of the nut but at any rate as soon as the uh, the slinger ring started to engage with the uh, the shaft where the bearing is uh, attached then things started to slow way down uh, because the uh, the fit was uh, preventing the rotation, so I was actually having to slide the nut across the top surface of the PVC, which was increasingly more difficult. So four, this is uh, it's inch and a quarter outside, uh, out, inch and a quarter PVC schedule 40 uh, that fit comfortably right over the shaft. Each length that looks like it's about one and three quarters or two inches, and each one is about a quarter of an inch longer than the last. So a uh, quarter inch, three eighths of an inch, something like that. Uh, the idea is that the shaft had to move farther to in total than the uh, the threaded section of the shaft would allow. That's how it went together. I thought this was going to be necessary. Turns out I needed four of these, one for each if I was going to use that method, but this is just a PVC cap that I drilled a hole in. Uh, but this didn't work any better than this did, than these pipes did, so no reason to no reason to bother with that. So that said, I'm going to clean up the uh, spindle cartridge here, uh, the outside of it, and then clean up the bore in the mill. Uh, the two are a fit, uh, fitted surface to keep the uh, the spindle itself in line with the uh, the table and the head and all that good stuff. So it's part of the alignment. It's a pretty close fit. So I'll start uh, start doing the cleanup here and then install everything and start doing test cuts to see if I need to adjust the, uh, the nut tighter to get rid of axial float or 
if it needs to be looser and there's too much heat getting generated. And I think there's a run-in procedure. I'll check that to be sure in the Tormach uh, bearing replacement instructions, but uh, that's essentially it for the assembly. So I just completed adjusting the torque on the uh, stack nut on the spindle here. It was running a little warm. I was idling it, I guess is a good term for it, because it wasn't cutting anything, but it was, uh, it was not spinning at slow RPM. It was spinning about 2,500 RPM. I let it run for about 10 minutes. The temperature settled into probably 110 degrees, as measured by sticking a tool in the nose. I was using one of these fancy gizmos here, the uh, non-contact pyrometer. Uh, I measured it inside the nose and I also verified by loading a tool, uh, in this case the uh, Superfly cutter since it has a, uh, has a black finish so it's a little less reflective so the uh, non-contact pyrometer gets a better reading off of it than a shiny surface. Uh, verify that it was staying about 100, between 105 and 110 degrees after running it for about 10 minutes at that speed. That's not cutting at all. So the temperature seemed high to me. Uh, what I decided to do was increase the RPM to 3,500 uh, RPM, and run. I, I guess I ran it for about a minute, and I checked the temperature then, and the temperature had already risen to close to 120, and, and the tool was very uncomfortable to hold if, when I pulled it out of the head. Uh, so I decided at that point that that was enough, and I took the uh, spindle out, which is a simple enough job now that I know how to do it. And put that, uh, uh, put the, um, so I took the spindle out now. I'm adjusting the torque if I can get my brain engaged here. What I'll actually do now is put the, the lock screw back in the, in the spindle stack nut. Um, I figured I'd cover the, uh, torquing procedure. Uh, not so much the method, because that's covered in Tormox Service Bulletin, but the method that I'm using to hold everything. I actually took the, uh, the fork off of the mill to hold the tool or hold the uh, the shaft in place while I use the, uh, the adjustable uh, face pin spanner to tighten it down. So I tightened it to about five degrees. I've heard some people say they tightened it more. I really cranked down on it last time thinking I needed to get up near 10 degrees uh, to get an idea of how things would run and there weren't any problems with the cut. The cut was fantastic. Uh, never mind the fact that he's a tram, but there's absolutely no indication whatsoever of uh, what would you call that axle axial float on the shaft. It, it's totally locked in, which makes sense because it wasn't going anywhere. I had it, I had it uh, just about as tight as you could get it. So I've reset the torque to five degrees torque to angle, uh, or somewhere thereabouts. I mean, how do you estimate that? I I got an idea of what five degrees look like and. I stopped when the, the load got too severe uh, and then called that five, decided not to go any further than that. So I'm going to load it back in the, uh, the spindle uh, bore of the mill right now. Everything's all oiled up still. Uh, there's a good oil film from the factory when I pulled it out, uh, so I figured I'd maintain that. At the very least, not only does it provide uh, rust protection, but it's also going to provide some degree of damping in the close fit that's in there. So, uh, whatever that's worth in this application, I don't know. Uh, but again, everything is ready to go back in now. So I'll cover the procedure for that. Alright, here we go. So I got the cartridge sitting on the mill uh, table, got some cardboard down. All I'm doing is getting a rough position of the uh, mill here. Sorry, I have the spindle cartridge, and then I'm going to lower the mill head down on it so that it gets close to the position where it needs to be aligned. Um, I've got it set up so that nothing is scraping the inside of the inside of the bore. So now I'll position it a little bit better by actually loading it. Now I've pushed it in, I've moved the z-axis down far enough that it's uh, that the, the body of the mill cartridge or the 
spindle cartridge is actually in the bore. And I'll just hold it up a little bit to keep it aligned and then advance it down. The other down. Now, this is the part where it's going to get interesting. I've lined up the keyway of the, uh, the shaft where it engages the inside of the pulley here. I've got a little bit of extra grease on the key to hold it in place. So it shouldn't pop out. I actually load this on top. Now the other, there are other ways of doing this, but it actually involves removing the motor because you can't get the, if you leave the spindle cartridge in place, you can't get the pulley off the top. So that's no fun. So I'm just lowering it down a little bit further now. The pulley itself is starting to get aligned. So the, the keyway is clear, and there we go. Now the uh, pulley is on the keyway for sure. So I can actually push the spindle cartridge the rest of the way in, and then engage a bolt. So there's no particular orientation that I've noticed of the uh, mill cartridge relative to the head. There are two holes drilled down through the uh, spindle uh, cartridge housing body. It looked like they're for cooling or uh, an air pressure balance or something along those lines, which are not, uh, they don't appear to go anywhere, but since I'm not the designer, I don't know for certain what they're for, uh, but they don't index to any feature on the mill head, so I figured that wasn't going to be a big issue if I didn't get it lined up. So now I'm just trying to get one bolt started, and then once I get the one started, it should be a lot easier to get to rest. So I get this thing positioned. You know how it is sometimes. There we go. It's making sounds like it's gonna start, but it's not starting. In this case, it actually was. This one went right in. All right. Head up. I see the pulley is actually holding the uh, the spindle cartridge in place. Not convinced that's a great idea right now, but this will give me an opportunity to get the bolt snugged up a little bit so that it's holding the weight. Move over here so that it's holding the weight rather than this pulley, because the pulley is going to put a moment on the shaft. So there we go. I have the bolt lifting the cartridge now. And then I'll start another bolt. It's pretty boring from here. For no reason other than, actually I'm going to set to 35, no reason other than it seems like a good idea to have these torqued in. So there are two steps left at this point. First I have to install the fork that uh, will hold the spindle in place. Here's the bolt and spacer that it sits on. And then I have to install the uh, nut at the top of the pulley. And that's it. All right, the fork is back in place, and the uh, spindle nut is on, ready to be tightened down. All right, satisfied with that. And let me find my trusty screwdriver over here and then tighten up the lock screw.
Here we go.